are you sure your Letty was telling the truth about how? she asked anxiously. Positive, said Michael. I know when she's lying, she stops twiddling her thumbs. She does too, said Sophie, chuckling. How do you know? Michael asked in surprise. Because she's my sister, uh, sister's granddaughter, said Sophie. And as a small girl, she was not always terribly truthful. But she's quite young and, uh, well, suppose she changes as she grows. She, uh, may not look quite the same in a year or so. Neither will I, said Michael. People our age change all the time. It won't worry us. She'll still be Letty. In a manner of speaking, Sophie thought. But suppose she was telling the truth, she went on anxiously, and she just knew Howl under a false name. Don't worry. I thought of that, said Michael. I described Howl. You must admit he's pretty recognisable. And she really hadn't seen him or his wretched guitar. I didn't even have to tell her he doesn't know how to play the thing. She never set eyes on him, and she twiddled her thumbs all the time she said she hadn't. That's a relief, Sophie said, lying stiffly back in her chair. And it certainly was a relief about Martha. But it was not much of a relief, because Sophie was positive that the only other Letty Hatter in the district was the real one. If there had been another, someone would have come into the hat shop and gossiped about it. It sounded like strong-minded Letty not giving in to Howl. What worried Sophie was that Letty had told Howl her real name. She might not be sure about him, but she liked him enough to trust him with an important secret like that. Don't look so anxious, Michael laughed, leaning on the back of the chair. Have a look at the cake I brought you. As Sophie started opening the box, it dawned on her that Michael had gone from seeing her as a natural disaster to actually liking her. She was so pleased and grateful that she decided to tell Michael the whole truth about Letty and Martha and herself too. It was only fair to let him know the sort of family he meant to marry into. The box came open. It was Cesare's most luscious cake, covered in cream and cherries and little curls of chocolate. Oh, said Sophie. The square knob over the door clicked round to Red Blob down of its own accord, and Howl came in. What a marvellous cake! My favourite kind, he said. Where did you get it? I, uh, called in at Cesare's, Michael said in a sheepish, self-conscious way. Sophie looked up at Howl. Something was always going to interrupt her when she decided to say she was under a spell. Even a wizard, it seemed. It looks worth the walk, Howl said, inspecting the cake. I've heard Cesare's is better than any of the cake shops in Kingsbury. Stupid of me never to have been in the place. And is that a pie I see on the bench? He went over to look. Pie in a bed of raw onions. Human skull looking put upon. He picked up the skull and knocked an onion ring out of its eye socket. I see Sophie has been busy again. Couldn't you have restrained her, my friend? The skull yatted its teeth at him. How looked startled and put it down rather hastily. Is something the matter? Michael asked. He seemed to know the signs. There is, said Howl. I shall have to find someone to blacken my name to the king. Was there something wrong with the wagon spell? said Michael. No, it worked perfectly. That's the trouble, Howl said, restlessly twiddling an onion ring on one finger. The king's trying to pin me down to do something else now. Calcifer, if we're not very careful, he's going to appoint me royal magician. Calcifer did not answer. Howl roved back to the fireside and realized Calcifer was asleep. Wake him up, Michael, he said. 
I need to consult him. Michael threw two logs on Calcifer and called him. Nothing happened, apart from a thin spire of smoke. Calcifer! Howl shouted. That did no good either. Howl gave Michael a mystified look and picked up the poker, which was something Sophie had never seen him do before. Sorry, Calcifer, he said, jabbing under the unburned logs. Wake up! One thick black cloud of smoke rolled up and stopped. Go away, Calcifer grunted. I'm tired. At this, Howl looked thoroughly alarmed. What's wrong with him? I've never known him like this before. I think it was the scarecrow, Sophie said. Howl swiveled round on his knees and levelled his glass marble eyes at her. What have you done now? He went on staring while Sophie explained. A scarecrow, he said. Calcifer agreed to speed up the castle because of a scarecrow? Dear Sophie, do please tell me how you bully a fire demon into being that obliging. I dearly love to know. I didn't bully him, said Sophie. It gave me a turn. And he was sorry for me. It gave her a turn, and Calcifer was sorry for her, Hal repeated. My good Sophie, Calcifer is never sorry for anyone. Anyway, I hope you enjoy raw onions and cold pie for your supper, because you've almost put Calcifer out. There's the cake, Michael said, trying to make peace. The food did seem to improve Hal's temper although he kept casting anxious looks at the unburning logs in the hearth all the time they were eating. The pie was good cold, and the onions were quite tasty when Sophie had soaked them in vinegar. The cake was superb. While they were eating it, Michael risked asking Hal what the king had wanted. Nothing definite yet, Hal said gloomily, but he was sounding me out about his brother quite ominously. Apparently... They had a good old argument before Prince Justin stormed off, and people are talking. The king obviously wanted me to volunteer to look for his brother, and like a fool I went and said I didn't think Wizard Solomon was dead, and that made matters worse. Why do you want to slither out and looking for the prince? Sophie demanded. Don't you think you can find him? Rude as well as a bully, aren't you? Hal said. He had still not forgiven her about Calcifer. I want to get out of it because I know I can find him, if you must know. Justin was great buddies with Solomon, and the argument was because he told the king he was going to look for him. He didn't think the king should have sent Solomon to the waste in the first place. Now even you must know there is a certain lady in the waste who is very bad news. She promised to fry me alive last year. And she sent a curse out after me that I've only avoided so far because I had the sense to give her a false name. Sophie was almost awed. You mean you jilted the Witch of the Waste? Hal cut himself another lump of cake, looking sad and honourable. That is not the way to put it. I admit I thought I was fond of her for a time. She is in some ways a very sad lady, very unloved. Every man in Ingri is scared stiff of her. You ought to know how that feels, Sophie dear. Sophie's mouth opened in utter indignation. Michael said quickly, Do you think we should move the castle? That's why you invented it, wasn't it? That depends on Calcifer. Hal looked over his shoulder at the barely smoking logs again. I must say, if I think of the king and the witch both after me, I get a craving for planting the castle on a nice frowning rock a thousand miles away. Michael obviously wished he had not spoken. So if he could see, he was thinking that a thousand miles was a terribly long way from Martha. But what happens to your Letty Hatter, she said to Howl, if you up and move?
I expect that will all be over by then, Hal said absently. But if I could only think of a way to get the king off my back. I know. He lifted his fork with a melting hunk of cream and cake on it and pointed it at Sophie. You can blacken my name to the king. You can pretend to be my old mother and plead for your blue-eyed boy. He gave Sophie the smile which had no doubt charmed the witch at the waist, and possibly Letty too, firing it along the fork, across the cream, straight into Sophie's eyes, dazzlingly. If you can bully Calcifer, the king should give you no trouble at all. Sophie stared through the dazzle and said nothing. This, she thought, was where she slithered out. She was leaving. It was too bad about Calcifer's contract. She had had enough of Howl, first green slime, then glaring at her for something Calcifer had done quite freely, and now this. Tomorrow she would slip off to upper folding and tell Letty all about it. Chapter 8 In which Sophie leaves the castle in several directions at once. To Sophie's relief, Calcifer blazed up bright and cheerful next morning. If she had not had enough of Howl, she would have been almost touched by how glad Howl was to see Calcifer. I thought she'd done for you, you old ball of gas, Howl said, kneeling at the hearth with his sleeves trailing in the ash. I was only tired, Calcifer said. There was some kind of drag on the castle. I'd never taken it that fast before. Well, don't let her make you do it again, said Hal. He stood up, gracefully brushing ash off his grey and scarlet suit. Make a start on that spell today, Michael. And if anyone comes from the king, I'm away on urgent private business until tomorrow. I'm going to see Letty, but you needn't tell him that. He picked up his guitar and opened the door with the knob green down onto the wide, cloudy hills. The scarecrow was there again. When Howl opened the door, it pitched sideways across him with its turnip face on his chest. The guitar uttered an awful twang. Sophie gave a faint squawk of terror and hung on to the chair. One of the scarecrow's stick arms was scraping stiffly round to get a purchase on the door. From the way Howl's feet were braced, it was clear he was being shoved quite hard. There was no doubt that the thing was determined to get into the castle. Calcifer's blue face leaned out of the grate. Michael stood stock still beyond. There really is a scarecrow, they both said. Oh, is there? Do tell, Howl panted. He got one foot up against the door frame and heaved. The scarecrow flew lumpishly away backward to land with a light rustle in the heather some yards off. It sprang up instantly and came hopping toward the castle again. Howl hurriedly laid the guitar on the doorstep and jumped down to meet it. No, you don't, my friend, he said with one hand out. Go back where you came from. He walked forward slowly, still with his hand out. The scarecrow retreated a little, hopping slowly and warily backward. When Howl stopped, the scarecrow stopped too, with its one leg planted in the heather and its ragged arms tilting this way and that, like a person sparring for an opening. The rags fluttering on its arms seemed a mad imitation of Howl's sleeves. So, you won't go, Howl said, and the turnip head slowly moved from side to side. No. I'm afraid you'll have to, Hal said. You scare Sophie, and there's no knowing what she'll do when she's scared. Come to think of it, you scare me too. Hal's arms moved heavily, as if he was lifting a large weight, until they were raised high above his head. 
he shouted out a strange word which was half hidden in a crack of sudden thunder, and the scarecrow went soaring away. Up and backward it went, rags fluttering, arms wheeling in protest, up and out and on and on, until it was a soaring speck in the sky, then a vanishing point in the clouds, and then not to be seen at all. Howell lowered his arms and came back to the doorway, mopping his face on the back of his hand. I take back my hard words, Sophie, he said, panting. That thing was alarming. It may have been dragging the castle back all yesterday. It had some of the strongest magic I've met. Whatever was it? All that was left of the last person you cleaned for? Sophie gave a weak little cackle of laughter. Her heart was behaving badly again. Hal realised something was wrong with her. He jumped indoors across his guitar, took hold of her elbow and sat her in the chair. Take it easy now. Something happened between Hal and Calcifer then. Sophie felt it, because she was being held by Hal, and Calcifer was still leaning out of the grate. Whatever it was, her heart began to behave properly almost at once. Howe looked at Calcifer, shrugged, and turned away to give Michael a whole lot of instructions about making Sophie keep quiet for the rest of the day. Then he picked up the guitar and left at last. Sophie lay in the chair and pretended to feel twice as ill as she did. She had to let Howe get out of sight. It was a nuisance he was going to upper folding as well, but she would walk so much more slowly that she would arrive around the time he started back. The important thing was not to meet him on the way. She watched Michael slyly while he spread out the spell and scratched his head over it. She waited until he dragged big leather books off the shelves and began making notes in a frantic, depressed sort of way. When he seemed properly absorbed, Sophie muttered several times, Stuffy in here. Michael took no notice. Terribly stuffy, Sophie said, getting up and shambling to the door. Fresh air. She opened the door and climbed out. Calcifer obligingly stopped the castle dead while she did. Sophie landed in the heather and took a look round to get her bearings. The road over the hills to Upper Folding was a sandy line through the heather just downhill from the castle. Naturally, Carcival would not make things inconvenient for Howell. Sophie set off toward it. She felt a little sad. She was going to miss Michael and Calcifer. She was almost at the road when there was shouting behind her. Michael came bounding down the hillside after her, and the tall black castle came bobbling along behind him, shedding anxious puffs of smoke from all four turrets. "'What are you doing?' Michael said when he caught up. From the way he looked at her, Sophie could see he thought the scarecrow had sent her wrong in the head. "'I'm perfectly all right,' Sophie said indignantly. "'I'm simply going to see my other sister's granddaughter. She's called Letty Hatter, too. Now do you understand?' "'Where does she live?' Michael demanded, as if he thought Sophie might not know. Upper folding, said Sophie. But that's over ten miles away, Michael said. I promised Howell I'd make you rest. I can't let you go. I told him I wouldn't let you out of my sight. Sophie did not look very kindly on this. Howell thought she was useful now because he wanted her to see the king. Of course, he did not want her to leave the castle. Huh, she said. Besides said Michael, slowly grasping the situation. Hal must have gone to Upper Folding, too. I'm quite sure he has, said Sophie. Then you're anxious about this girl, if she's your great niece, Michael said, arriving at the point at last. I see. But I can't let you go. I'm going, said Sophie. But if Hal sees you there, he'll be furious. Michael went on working things out, because I promised him he'll be mad with both of us. You ought to rest. Then, 
When Sophie was almost ready to hit him, he exclaimed, Wait! There's a pair of seven-league boots in the broom cupboard. He took Sophie by her skinny old wrist and towed her uphill to the waiting castle. She was forced to give little hops in order not to catch her feet in the heather. But, she panted, seven leagues is twenty-one miles. I'd be halfway to Port Haven in two strides. No, it's ten and a half miles a step, said Michael. That makes upper folding almost exactly. If we each take one boot and go together, then I won't be letting you out of my sight and you won't be doing anything strenuous and we'll get there before Hal does, so he won't even know we've been. That solves all our problems beautifully. Michael was so pleased with himself that Sophie did not have the heart to protest. She shrugged and supposed Michael had better find out about the two letters before they changed looks again. It was more honest this way. But when Michael fetched the boots from the broom cupboard, Sophie began to have doubts. Up to now, she had thought they were two leather buckets that had somehow lost their handles and then got a little squashed. "'You're supposed to put your foot in them, shoe and all,' Michael explained, as he carried the two heavy bucket-shaped things to the door. "'These are the prototypes of the boots Hal made for the King's army. We managed to get the later ones a bit lighter and more boot-shaped. He and Sophie sat on the doorstep and each put one foot in a boot. Point yourself toward upper folding before you put the boot down, Michael warned her. He and Sophie stood up on the foot, which was in an ordinary shoe, and carefully swung themselves round to face upper folding. Now, tread, said Michael. Zip! The landscape instantly rushed past them so fast it was only a blur. A grey-green blur for the land, and a blue-grey blur for the sky. The wind of their going tore at Sophie's hair and dragged every wrinkle in her face backward until she thought she would arrive with half her face behind each ear. The rushing stopped as suddenly as it had begun. Everything was calm and sunny. They were knee-deep in buttercups in the middle of Upper Folding Village Common. A cow nearby stared at them. Beyond it, thatched cottages drowsed under trees. Unfortunately, the bucket-like boot was so heavy that Sophie staggered as she landed. Don't put that foot down, Michael yelled. Too late. There was another zipping blur and more rushing wind. When it stopped, Sophie found herself right down the folding valley, almost into marsh folding. Oh, drat, she said, and hopped carefully round on her shoe and tried again. Zip! Blur! And she was back on upper folding green again, staggering forward with the weight of the boot. She had a glimpse of Michael diving to catch her. Zip! Blur! Oh, bother! wailed Sophie. She was up in the hills again. The crooked black shape of the castle was drifting peacefully nearby. Carcifer was amusing himself blowing black smoke rings from one turret. Sophie saw that much before her shoe caught in the heather and she stumbled forward again. Zip! Zip! This time Sophie visited, in rapid succession, the market square of Market Chipping and the front lawn of a very grand mansion. Blow! she cried. Drat! One word for each place, and she was off again with her own momentum and another zip right down at the end of that valley in a field somewhere. A large red bull raised its ring nose from the grass and thoughtfully lowered its horns. I'm just leaving, my good beast, Sophie cried, hopping herself round frantically. Zip back to the mansion, zip to Market Square, zip, and there was the castle yet again. She was getting the hang of it. Zip, here was upper folding, but how did you stop? Zip, oh, confound it, Sophie cried, almost in marsh folding again. This time, she hopped round very carefully and trod with great deliberation. Zip, and fortunately, the boot landed in a cow pat and she sat down with a thump. Michael sprinted up before Sophie could move and dragged the boot off her foot. Thank you, Sophie cried breathlessly. There seemed no reason why I should ever stop. Sophie's heart pounded a bit as they walked across the common to Mrs. Fairfax's house, but only in the way hearts do when you have done a lot rather quickly.
she felt very grateful for whatever Howl and Culcifer had done. Nice place, Michael remarked, as he hid the boots in Mrs. Fairfax's hedge. Sophie agreed. The house was the biggest in the village. It was thatched, with white walls between the black beams, and, as Sophie remembered from visits as a child, you walked up to the porch through a garden crowded with flowers and humming with bees. Over the porch, a honeysuckle and a white climbing rose were competing as to which could give most work to the bees. It was a perfect hot summer morning down here in Upper Folding. Mrs. Fairfax answered the door herself. She was one of those plump, comfortable ladies with swathes of butter-coloured hair coiled round her head, who made you feel good with life just to look at her. Sophie felt just the tiniest bit envious of Letty. Mrs. Fairfax looked from Sophie to Michael. She had seen Sophie last a year ago as a girl of seventeen, and there was no reason for her to recognise her as an old woman of ninety. "'Good morning to you,' she said politely. Sophie sighed. Michael said, "'This is Letty Hatter's great-aunt. I brought her here to see Letty.' "'Oh, I thought the face looked familiar,' Mrs. Fairfax exclaimed. "'There's quite a family likeness. Do come in. Letty's a little bit busy just now, but have some scones and honey while you wait.' She opened her front door wider. Instantly, a large collie dog squeezed past Mrs. Fairfax's skirts, barged between Sophie and Michael, and ran across the nearest flower bed, snapping off flowers right and left. Oh, stop him! Mrs. Fairfax gasped, flying off in pursuit. I don't want him out just now. There was a minute or so of helter-skelter chase in which the dog ran hither and thither, whining in a disturbed way, and Mrs. Fairfax and Sophie ran after the dog, jumping flower beds and getting in one another's way, and Michael ran after Sophie, crying, Stop! You'll make yourself ill! Then the dog set off, loping round one corner of the house. Michael realised that the way to stop Sophie was to stop the dog. He made a crosswise dash through the flower beds, plunged round the house after the dog, and seized it by two handfuls of its thick coat, just as it reached the orchard at the back. Sophie hobbled up to find Michael pulling the dog away backward and making such strange faces at her that she thought at first he was ill. But he jerked his head so often toward the orchard that she realised he was only trying to tell her something. She stuck her face round the corner of the house, expecting to see a swarm of bees. Howl was there with Letty. They were in a grove of mossy apple trees in full bloom, with a row of beehives in the distance. Letty sat in a white garden seat. Howl was kneeling on one knee in the grass at her feet, holding one of her hands and looking noble and ardent. Letty was smiling lovingly at him. But the worst of it, as far as Sophie was concerned, was that Letty did not look like Martha at all. She was her own extremely beautiful self. She was wearing a dress of the same kind of pinks and white as the crowded apple blossom overhead. Her dark hair trailed in glossy curls over one shoulder, and her eyes shone with devotion for Hal. Sophie brought her head back round the corner and looked with dismay at Michael holding the whining collie dog. He must have had a speed spell with him, Michael whispered, equally dismayed. Mrs. Fairfax caught them up, panting and trying to pin back a loose coil of her buttery hair. Bad dog, she said in a fierce whisper to the collie. I'll put a spell on you if you do that once more. The dog blinked and crouched down. Mrs. Fairfax pointed a stern finger. Into the house. Stay in the house. The collie shook himself free of Michael's hands and slunk away round the house again. Thank you so much, Mrs. Fairfax said to Michael as they all followed it. He will keep trying to bite Letty's visitor. Inside, she shouted sternly in the front garden, as the collie seemed to be thinking of going round the house and getting to the orchard the other way. The dog gave her a woeful look over its shoulder, and crawled dismally indoors through the porch. That dog may have the right idea, Sophie said. 
Mrs. Fairfax, do you know who Letty's visitor is? Mrs. Fairfax chuckled. The wizard Pendragon, or how, or whatever he calls himself, she said. But Letty and I don't let on we know. It amused me when he first turned up, calling himself Sylvester Oak, because I could see he'd forgotten me, though I hadn't forgotten him, even though his hair used to be black in his student days. Mrs. Fairfax, by now, had her hands folded in front of her and was standing bolt upright, prepared to talk all day, as Sophie had often seen her do before. He was my old tutor's very last pupil, you know, before she retired. When Mr. Fairfax was alive, he used to like me to transport us both to Kingsbury to see a show from time to time. I can manage too very nicely if I take it slowly. And I always used to drop in on old Mrs. Pence Stemmon while I was there. She likes her old pupils to keep in touch. And one time she introduced this young Howl to us. Oh, she was proud of him. She taught Wizard Solomon, too, you know. And she said Howl was twice as good. But don't you know the reputation Howl has? Michael interrupted. Getting into Mrs. Fairfax's conversation was rather like getting into a turning skipping rope. You had to choose the exact moment, but once you were in, you were in. Mrs. Fairfax turned herself slightly to face Michael. Most of it's just talk, to my mind, she said. Michael opened his mouth to say that it was not, but he was in the skipping rope then, and it went on turning. And I said to Letty, here's your big chance, my love. I knew how could teach her twenty times more than I could, for I don't mind telling you, Letty's brains go way beyond mine, and she could end up in the same league as the Witch of the Waste, only in a good way. Letty's a good girl, and I'm fond of her. If Mrs. Pence Stemmon was still teaching, I'd have Letty to her tomorrow. But she isn't. So I said, Letty? Here's Wizard Howl courting you, and you could do worse than fall in love with him yourself and let him be your teacher. The pair of you will go far. I don't think Letty was too keen on the idea at first, but she's been softening lately, and today it seems to be going beautifully. Here Mrs. Fairfax paused to beam benevolently at Michael, and Sophie dashed into the skipping rope for her turn. Someone told me Letty was fond of someone else, she said. Sorry for him, you mean, said Mrs. Fairfax. She lowered her voice. There's a terrible disability there, she whispered suggestively, and it's asking too much of any girl. I told him so. I'm sorry for him myself. Sophie managed a mystified, oh, but it's a fearsomely strong spell. It's very sad, Mrs. Fairfax wound on. I had to tell him that there's no way someone of my abilities can break anything that's put on by the Witch of the Waste. Howl might, but of course he can't ask Howl, can he? Here Michael had kept looking nervously to the corner of the house in case Howl came round it and discovered them, managed to trample through the skipping rope and stop it by saying, I think we'd better be going. Are you sure you won't come in for a taste of my honey? asked Mrs. Fairfax. I use it in nearly all my spells, you know. And she was off again, this time about the magical properties of honey. Michael and Sophie walked purposefully down the path to the gate, and Mrs. Fairfax drifted behind them, talking away and sorrowfully straightening plants that the dog had bent as she talked. Sophie, meanwhile, racked her brains for a way to find out how Mrs. Fairfax knew Letty was Letty, without upsetting Michael. Mrs. Fairfax paused to gasp a bit as she heaved a large lupin upright. Sophie took the plunge. Mrs. Fairfax, wasn't it my niece Martha who was supposed to come to you? Naughty girls! Mrs. Fairfax said, smiling and shaking her head as she emerged from the lupin, as if I wouldn't recognise one of my own honey-based spells. 
but as I said to her at the time, I'm not one to keep anyone against their will, and I'd always rather teach someone who wants to learn. Only, I said to her, I'll have no pretense here. You stay as your own self or not at all. And it's worked out very happily, as you see. Are you sure you won't stay and ask her for yourself? I think we'd better go, Sophie said. We'll have to get back. Michael added, with another nervous look toward the orchard. He collected the seven-league boots from the hedge and set one down outside the gate for Sophie. And I'm going to hold on to you this time, he said. Mrs. Fairfax leaned over her gate while Sophie inserted her foot in the boot. Seven leaguers, she said. Would you believe? I've not seen one of those for years. Very useful things for someone your age, Mrs. Er. Uh, I wouldn't mind a pair myself these days. So it's you Letty inherits her witchcraft from, is it? Hmm? Not that it necessarily runs in families, but as often as not. Michael took hold of Sophie's arm and pulled. Both boots came down, and the rest of Mrs. Fairfax's talk vanished in the zip and rush of air. Next moment, Michael had to brace his feet in order not to collide with the castle. The door was open. Inside, Calcifer was roaring. Port Haven door! Someone's been banging on it ever since you left! Chapter 9 In which Michael has trouble with a spell It was the sea captain at the door, come for his wind spell at last, and not at all pleased at having to wait. If I miss my tide, boy... "'he said to Michael. "'I shall have a word with a sorcerer about you. "'I don't like lazy boys.' "'Michael, in Sophie's opinion, was far too polite to him, "'but she was feeling too dejected to interfere. "'When the captain had gone, "'Michael went to the bench to frown over his spell again, "'and Sophie sat silently mending her stockings. "'She had only the one pair, "'and her knobby feet had worn huge holes in them. Her grey dress by this time was frayed and dirty. She wondered whether she dared cut the least stained bits out of Hal's ruined blue and silver suit to make herself a new skirt with. But she did not quite dare. Sophie, Michael said, looking up from his eleventh page of notes, how many nieces have you? Sophie had been afraid Michael would start asking questions. When you get to my age, my lad, she said, you lose count. They all look so alike. Those two Lettys could be twins, to my mind. Oh, no. Not really, Michael said, to her surprise. The niece in upper folding isn't as pretty as my Letty. He tore up the eleventh page and made a twelfth. I'm glad Hal didn't meet my Letty, he said. He began on his thirteenth page and tore that up, too. I wanted to laugh when that Mrs. Fairfax said she knew who Hal was, didn't you? No, said Sophie. It had made no difference to Letty's feelings. She thought of Letty's bright, adoring face under the apple blossom. I suppose there's no chance, she asked hopelessly, that Hal could be properly in love this time. Calcifer snorted green sparks up the chimney. I was afraid you'd start thinking that. "'Michael said. "'But you'd be deceiving yourself, just like Mrs. Fairfax.' "'How do you know?' said Sophie. "'Calcifer and Michael exchanged glances. "'Did he forget to spend at least an hour in the bathroom this morning?' "'Michael said. "'He was in there two hours,' said Calcifer, "'putting spells on his face, vain fool.' "'There you are, then,' said Michael.' The day Hal forgets to do that will be the day I believe he's really in love, and not before. Sophie thought of Hal on one knee in the orchard, posing to look as handsome as possible, and she knew they were right. She thought of going to the bathroom and tipping all Hal's beauty spells down the toilet, but she didn't quite dare. Instead, she hobbled up and fetched the blue and silver suit, 
which she spent the rest of the day cutting little blue triangles out of in order to make a patchwork sort of skirt. Michael patted her shoulder kindly as he came to throw all seventeen pages of his notes onto Calcifer. Everyone gets over things in the end, you know, he said. By this time it was clear Michael was having trouble with his spell. He gave up the notes and scraped some soot off the chimney. Calcifer craned round to watch him in a mystified way. Michael took a withered root from one of the bags hanging on the beams and put it in the soot. Then, after much thought, he turned the doorknob blue down and vanished for twenty minutes into Port Haven. He came back with a large walled seashell and put that with the root in the soot. After that he tore up pages and pages of paper and put those in too. He put the lot in front of the human skull and stood blowing on it so that soot and bits of paper whirled all over the bench. "'What's he doing, do you think?' Calcifer asked Sophie. Michael gave up blowing and started mashing everything, paper and all, with a pestle and mortar, looking at the skull expectantly from time to time. Nothing happened, so he tried different ingredients from bags and jars. "'I feel bad about spying on Hal.' he announced as he pounded a third set of ingredients to death in a bowl. He may be fickle to females, but he's been awfully good to me. He took me in when I was just an unwanted orphan sitting on his doorstep in Port Haven. How did that come about? asked Sophie as she snipped out another blue triangle. My mother died and my father got drowned in a storm, Michael said, and nobody wants you when that happens. I had to leave our house because I couldn't pay rent. And I tried to live in the streets, but people kept turning me off doorsteps and out of boats, until the only place I could think of to go was somewhere everyone was too scared of to interfere with. Howler just started up in a small way as Sorcerer Jenkin then, but everyone said his house had devils in it. So I slept on his doorstep for a couple of nights, until Howl opened the door one morning on his way to buy bread and I fell inside. So he said I could wait indoors while he got something to eat. I went in, and there was Calcifer, and I started talking to him, because I'd never met a demon before. What did you talk about? said Sophie, wondering if Calcifer had asked Michael to break his contract too. He told me his troubles and dripped on me, didn't you? said Calcifer. It didn't seem to occur to him that I might have troubles as well. I don't think you have. You just grumble a lot, Michael said. You were quite nice to me that morning, and I think Hal was impressed. But you know how he is. He didn't tell me I could stay. He just didn't tell me to go. So I started being useful wherever I could, like looking after money so that he didn't spend it all as soon as he'd got it, and so on. The spell gave a sort of woof then and exploded mildly. Michael brushed soot off the skull, sighing, and tried new ingredients. Sophie began making a patchwork of blue triangles round her feet on the floor. I did make a lot of stupid mistakes when I first started, Michael went on. How was awfully nice about it. I thought I'd got over that now, and I think I do help with money. How buys such expensive clothes? He says... No one's going to employ a wizard who looks as if he can't make money at the trade. That's just because he likes clothes, said Calcifer. His orange eyes watched Sophie at work rather meaningly. This suit was spoiled, Sophie said. It isn't just clothes, Michael said. Remember last winter when we were down to your last log and Hal went off and bought the skull and that stupid guitar? I was really annoyed with him. He said they looked good. What did you do about logs? Sophie asked. Hal conjured some from someone who owed him money, Michael said. At least he said they did, and I just hoped he was telling the truth. And we ate seaweed. Hal says it's good for you. Nice stuff, murmured Calcifer, dry and crackly. I hate it said Michael, staring abstractedly at his bowl of pounded stuff. I don't know. There should be seven ingredients, unless it's seven processes. But let's try it in a pentacle anyway. He put the bowl on the floor 
and chalked a sort of five-pointed star around it. The powder exploded with a force that blew Sophie's triangles into the hearth. Michael swore and hurriedly rubbed out the chalk marks. Sophie, he said, I'm stuck in this spell. You don't think you could possibly help me, do you? Just like someone bringing their homework to their granny, Sophie thought, collecting triangles and patiently laying them out again. Let's have a look, she said cautiously. I don't know anything about magic, you know. Michael eagerly thrust a strange, slightly shiny paper into her hand. It looked unusual, even for a spell. It was printed in bold letters, but they were slightly grey and blurred, and there were grey blurs, like retreating storm clouds round all the edges. See what you think, said Michael. Sophie read, Go and catch a falling star. Get with child a mandrake root. Tell me where all past years are, or who cleft the devil's foot. Teach me to hear the mermaid singing, or to keep off envy's stinging, and find what wind serves to advance an honest mind. Decide what this is about. Write a second verse yourself. It puzzled Sophie exceedingly. It was not quite like any of the spells she had snooped at before. She ploughed through it twice, not really helped by Michael eagerly explaining as she tried to read. You know, Hal told me that advanced spells have a puzzle in them. Well, I decided at first that every line was meant to be a puzzle. I used soot with sparks in it for the falling star and a seashell for the mermaid singing, and I thought I might count as a child. So I got a mandrake root down, and I wrote out lists of past years from the almanacs, but I wasn't sure about that. Maybe that's where I went wrong. And could the thing that stops stinging be dock leaf? I hadn't thought of that before. Anyway, none of it works. I'm not surprised, said Sophie. It looks to me like a set of impossible things to do. But Michael was not having that. If the things were impossible, he pointed out reasonably, no one would ever be able to do the spell. And, he added, I'm so ashamed of spying on Hal that I want to make up for it by getting this spell right. Very well, said Sophie. Let's start with decide what this is about. That ought to start things moving, if deciding is part of the spell anyway. But Michael was not having that either. No, he said. It's the sort of spell that reveals itself as you do it. That's what the last line means. When you write the second half, saying what the spell means, that makes it work. Those kind are very advanced. We have to crack the first bit first. Sophie collected her blue triangles into a pile again. Let's ask Calcifer, she suggested. Calcifer, who... But this was yet another thing Michael did not let her do. No, be quiet. I think Calcifer's part of the spell. Look at the way it says, Tell me and teach me. I thought at first it meant teach the skull, but that didn't work, so it must be Calcifer. You can do it by yourself if you sit on everything I have to say, Sophie said. Anyway, surely Calcifer must know who cleft his own foot. Calcifer flared up a little at this. I haven't got any feet. I'm a demon, not a devil. Saying which, he retreated right under his logs, where he could be heard chinking about, muttering, Lot of nonsense. All the rest of the time, Sophie and Michael were discussing the spell. By this time, the puzzle had got a grip on Sophie. She packed away her blue triangles, fetched pen and paper, and started making notes in the same sort of quantities that Michael had. For the rest of the day, she and Michael sat staring into the distance, nibbling quills and throwing out suggestions at one another. An average page of Sophie's notes read, Does garlic keep off envy? I could cut a star out of paper and drop it. Could we tell it to Howl? Howl would like mermaids better than Calcifer. Do not think Howl's mind honest. It's Calcifer's. Where are past years anyway? Does it mean one of those dry roots must bear fruit? Plant it, next to dock leaf, in seashell, 
cloven hoof, most things but horses. Sure horse with a clove of garlic? Wine? Smell? Wind of seven league boots? Is howl devil? Cloven toes in seven league boots? Mermaids in boots? As Sophie wrote this, Michael asked equally desperately, Could the wind be some sort of pulley? An honest man being hanged? That's black magic, though. Let's have supper, said Sophie. They ate bread and cheese, still staring into distance. At last, Sophie said, Michael, for goodness sake, let's give up guessing and try doing just what it says. Where's the best place to catch a shooting star? Out on the hills? Port Haven marshes are flatter, Michael said. Can we? Shooting stars go awfully fast. So can we, in seven league boots, Sophie pointed out. Michael sprang up, full of relief and delight. I think you've got it, he said, scrambling for the boots. Let's go and try. This time, Sophie prudently took her stick and her shawl, since it was now quite dark. Michael was turning the doorknob blew down when two strange things happened. On the bench, the teeth of the skull started clattering, and Calcifer blazed right up the chimney. I don't want you to go, he said. We'll be back soon, Michael said soothingly. They went out into the street in Port Haven. It was a bright, balmy night. As soon as they had reached the end of the street, however, Michael remembered that Sophie had been ill that morning and began worrying about the effect of the night air on her health. Sophie told him not to be silly. She stumped gamely along with her stick until they left the lighted windows behind and the night became wide and damp and chilly. The marshes smelled of salt and earth. The sea glittered and softly swished to the rear. Sophie could feel, more than see, the miles and miles of flatness stretching away in front of them. What she could see were bands of low bluish mist and pale glimmers of marshy pools over and over again until they built into a pale line where the sky started. The sky was everywhere else, huger still. The Milky Way looked like a band of mist risen from the marshes, and the keen stars twinkled through it. Michael and Sophie stood, each with a boot ready on the ground in front of them, waiting for one of the stars to move. After about an hour, Sophie had to pretend she was not shivering for fear of worrying Michael. Half an hour later, Michael said, May is not the right time of year. August or November is best. Half an hour after that, he said in a worried way, What do we do about the mandrake root? Let's see to this part before we worry about that, Sophie said, biting her teeth together while she spoke for fear they would chatter. Sometime later, Michael said, You go home, Sophie. It's my spell after all. Sophie had her mouth open to say that this was a very good idea, when one of the stars came unstuck from the firmament and darted in a white streak down the sky. There's one! Sophie shrieked instead. Michael thumped his foot into his boot and was off. Sophie braced herself with her stick and was off a second later. Zip! Squash! Down, far out in the marshes, with mist and emptiness and dull glimmering pools in all directions, Sophie stabbed her stick into the ground and managed to stand still. Michael's boot was a dark blot standing just beside her. Michael himself was a sploshy sound of madly running feet somewhere ahead. And there was the falling star. Sophie could see it, a little white descending flame shape a few yards beyond the dark movements that were Michael. The bright shape was coming down slowly now, and it looked as if Michael might catch it. Sophie dragged her shoe out of the boot. Come on, stick, she crowed. Get me there! And she set off at top hobble, leaping across tussocks and staggering through pools with her eyes on that little white light. By the time she caught up, Michael was stalking the star with soft steps, both arms out to catch it. Sophie could see him outlined against the star's light. The star was drifting level with Michael's hands and only a step or so beyond. It was looking back at him nervously. How odd, 
Sophie thought. It was made of light. It lit up a white ring of grass and reeds and black pools round Michael. And yet it had big, anxious eyes peering backward at Michael and a small, pointed face. Sophie's arrival frightened it. It gave an erratic swoop and cried out in a shrill, crackling voice, What is it? What do you want? Sophie tried to say to Michael, Do stop. It's terrified. But she had no breath left to speak with. I only want to catch you, Michael explained. I won't hurt you. No, no, the star crackled desperately. That's wrong. I'm supposed to die. But I could save you if you'd let me catch you, Michael told it gently. No, cried the star. I'd rather die. It dived away from Michael's fingers. Michael plunged for it, but it was too quick for him. It swooped for the nearest marsh pool, and the black water leaped into a blaze of whiteness for just an instant. Then there was a small, dying sizzle. When Sophie hobbled over, Michael was standing watching the last light fade out of a little round lump under the dark water. That was sad, Sophie said. Michael sighed. Yes, my heart sort of went out to it. Let's go home. I'm sick of this spell. It took them twenty minutes to find the boots. Sophie thought it was a miracle they found them at all. You know, Michael said as they trudged dejectedly through the dark streets of Port Haven, I can tell I'll never be able to do this spell. It's too advanced for me. I shall have to ask Hal. I hate giving in, but at least I'll get some sense out of Hal now this Letty Hatter's given in to him. This did not cheer Sophie up at all. Chapter 10 In which Calcifer promises Sophie a hint Hal must have come back while Sophie and Michael were out. He came out of the bathroom while Sophie was frying breakfast on Calcifer and sat gracefully in the chair, groomed and glowing and smelling of honeysuckle. Dear Sophie, he said, always busy. You were hard at work yesterday, weren't you, in spite of my advice? Why have you made a jigsaw puzzle of my best suit? Just a friendly inquiry, you know. You jellied it the other day, said Sophie. I'm making it over. I can do that, said Howell. I thought I showed you. I can also make you a pair of seven-league boots of your own, if you give me your size. Something practical in brown calf, perhaps? It's amazing the way one can take a step ten and a half miles long and still always land in a cow pat. It may have been a bull pat, said Sophie. I dare say you found mud from the marshes on them, too. A person my age needs a lot of exercise. You were even busier than I realized, then, said Hal, because when I happened to tear my eyes from Letty's lovely face for an instant yesterday... I could have sworn I saw your long nose poking round the corner of the house. Mrs. Fairfax is a family friend, said Sophie. How was I to know you would be there too? You have an instinct, Sophie, that's how, said Hal. Nothing is safe from you. If I were to court a girl who lived on an iceberg in the middle of an ocean, sooner or later, probably sooner, I'd look up to see you swooping overhead on a broomstick. In fact, by now I'd be disappointed in you if I didn't see you. Are you off to the iceberg today? Sophie retorted. From the look on Letty's face yesterday, there's nothing that need keep you there. You wrong me, Sophie, Hal said. He sounded deeply injured. Sophie looked suspiciously sideways. Beyond the red jewels swinging in Hal's ear, his profile looked sad and noble. Long years will pass before I leave Letty, he said, and in fact I'm off to see the king again today, satisfied, Mrs. Nose. Sophie was not sure she believed a word of this, though it was certainly to Kingsbury with the doorknob read down that Hal departed after breakfast, waving Michael aside when Michael tried to consult him about the perplexing spell. Michael, since he had nothing left to do, left too. He said he might as well go to Cesare's. 
Sophie was left alone. She still did not truly believe what Howell had said about Letty, but she'd been wrong about him before, and she had only Michael and Calcifer's word for Howell's behaviour after all. She collected up all the little blue triangles of cloth and began guiltily sewing them back into the silver fishing net, which was all that was left of the suit. When someone knocked at the door, she started violently, thinking it was the scarecrow again. Port Haven door, Calcifer said, flickering a purple grin at her. That shall be all right, then. Sophie hobbled over and opened it, blew down. There was a cart horse outside. The young fellow of fifty who was leading it wondered if Mrs. Witch had something which might stop it casting shoes all the time. I'll see, said Sophie. She hobbled over to the grate. What shall I do? she whispered. Yellow powder, fourth jar, along on the second shelf, Calcifer whispered back. Those spells are mostly belief. Don't look uncertain when you give it to him. So Sophie poured yellow powder into a square of paper, as she'd seen Michael do, twisted it smartly, and hobbled to the door with it. There you are, my boy, she said. That'll stick the shoes on harder than any hundred nails. Do you hear me, horse? You won't need a smith for the next year. That'll be a penny. Thank you. It was quite a busy day. Sophie had to put down her sewing and sell, with Calcifer's help, a spell to unblock drains, another to fetch goats, and something to make good beer. The only one that gave her any trouble was the customer who pounded on the door in Kingsbury. Sophie opened it red down to find a richly dressed boy, not much older than Michael, white-faced and sweating, wringing his hands on the doorstep. "'Madam Sorceress, for pity's sake,' he said, "'I have to fight a duel at dawn tomorrow. Give me something to make sure I win. I'll pay any sum you ask.' Sophie looked over her shoulder at Calcifer, and Calcifer made faces back, meaning that there was no such thing ready-made. That wouldn't be right at all, Sophie told the boy severely. Besides, dueling is wrong. Then just give me something that lets me have a fair chance, the lad said desperately. Sophie looked at him. He was very undersized and clearly in a great state of fear. He had that hopeless look a person has who always loses at everything. I'll see what I can do, Sophie said. She hobbled over to the shelves and scanned the jars. The red one, labelled Cayenne, looked the most likely. Sophie poured a generous heap of it on a square of paper. She stood the human skull beside it. "'Because you must know more about this than I do,' she muttered at it. The young man was leaning anxiously round the door to watch. Sophie took up a knife and made what she hoped would look like mystic passes over the heap of pepper. You are to make it a fair fight, she mumbled. A fair fight, understand? She screwed the paper up and hobbled to the door with it. Throw this in the air when the duel starts, she told the undersized young man. And it will give you the same chance as the other man. After that, whether you win or not, depends on you. The undersized young man was so grateful that he tried to give her a gold piece. Sophie refused to take it. So he gave her a two-penny bit instead, and went away, whistling happily. "'I feel a fraud,' Sophie said as she stowed the money under the hearthstone. "'But I would like to be there at that fight.' "'So would I,' cackled Calcifer. "'When are you going to release me so that I can go and see things like that?' "'When I've got even a hint about this contract,' Sophie said. "'You may get one later today.' said Calcifer. Michael breezed in toward the end of the afternoon. He took an anxious look round to make sure Howell had not come home first, and went to the bench, where he got things out to make it look as if he'd been busy, singing cheerfully while he did. "'I envy you being able to walk all that way so easily,' Sophie said, sewing a blue triangle to silver braid. "'How was my—' "'My niece!' Michael gladly left the workbench and sat on the stool by the hearth to tell her all about his day. Then he asked about Sophie's. 
The result was that when Howell shouldered the door open with his arms full of parcels, Michael was not even looking busy. He was rolling around on the stool, laughing at the dual spell. Howell backed into the door to shut it and leaned there in a tragic attitude. Look at you all, he said. Ruin stares me in the face. I slave all day for you all, and not one of you, even Calcifer, can spare time to say hello. Michael sprang up guiltily, and Calcifer said, I never do say hello. Is something wrong? asked Sophie. That's better, said Hal. Some of you are pretending to notice me at last. How kind of you to ask, Sophie. Yes, something is wrong. The king has asked me officially to find his brother for him, with a strong hint that destroying the Witch at the Waste would come in handy too, and you all sit there and laugh. By now it was clear that Hal was in a mood to produce green slime any second. Sophie hurriedly put her sewing away. I'll make some hot butter toast, she said. Is that all you can do in the face of tragedy? Howell asked. Make toast. No, don't get up. I've trudged here laden with stuff for you. So the least you can do is to show polite interest. Here. He tipped a shower of parcels into Sophie's lap and handed another to Michael. Mystified, Sophie unwrapped things. Several pairs of silk stockings, two parcels of the finest cambric petticoats with flounces, lace and satin insets, a pair of elastic-sided boots in dove-grey suede, a lace shawl and a dress of grey watered silk trimmed with lace that matched the shawl. Sophie took one professional look at each and gasped. The lace alone was worth a fortune. She stroked the silk of the dress awed. Michael unwrapped a handsome new velvet suit. You must have spent every bit that was in the silk purse, he said ungratefully. I don't need this. You're the one who needs a new suit. Howell hooked his boot into what remained of the blue and silver suit and held it up ruefully. Sophie had been working hard, but it was still more whole than suit. How selfless I am, he said. But I can't send you and Sophie to blacken my name to the king in rags. The king would think I didn't look after my old mother properly. Well, Sophie, are the boots the right size? Sophie looked up from her awed stroking. Are you being kind, she said, or cowardly? Thank you very much, and no, I won't. What ingratitude, Howell exclaimed, spreading out both arms. Let's have green slime again, after which I shall be forced to move the castle a thousand miles away and never see my lovely Letty again. Michael looked at Sophie imploringly. Sophie glowered. She saw well enough that the happiness of both her sisters depended on her agreeing to see the king. With green slime in reserve. You haven't asked me to do anything yet, she said. You just said I'm going to. Hal smiled. And you are going to, aren't you? All right. When do you want me to go? Sophie said. Tomorrow afternoon, said Howell. Michael can go as your footman. The king's expecting you. He sat on the stool and began explaining very clearly and soberly just what Sophie was to say. There was no trace of the green slime mood. Now things were going Howell's way, Sophie noticed. She wanted to slap him. I want you to do a very delicate job, Hal explained, so that the king will go on giving me work like the transport spells, but not trust me with anything like finding his brother. You must tell him how I've angered the Witch of the Waste, and explain what a good son I am to you. But I want you to do it in such a way that he'll understand I'm really quite useless. Hal explained in great detail. Sophie clasped her hands round the parcels and tried to take it all in, though she could not help thinking, if I was the king, I wouldn't understand a word of what the old woman was driving at. Michael, meanwhile, was hovering at Hal's elbow, trying to ask him about the perplexing spell. 
Powell kept thinking of new, delicate details to tell the king, and waving Michael away. Not now, Michael. And it occurred to me, Sophie, that you might want some practice in order not to find the palace overwhelming. We don't want you coming over queer in the middle of the interview. Not yet, Michael. So I arranged for you to pay a call to my old tutor, Mrs. Pentstemon. She's a grand old thing. In some ways, she's grander than the king. So you'll be quite used to that kind of thing by the time you get to the palace. By this time, Sophie was wishing she had never agreed. She was heartily relieved when Howell at last turned to Michael. Right, Michael. Your turn now. What is it? Michael waved the shiny grey paper and explained, in an unhappy rush, how impossible the spell seemed to do. Howell seemed faintly astonished to hear this, but he took the paper, saying, Now, where was your problem? And spread it out. He stared at it. One of his eyebrows shot up. I tried it as a puzzle, and I tried doing it just as it says, Michael explained, but Sophie and I couldn't catch the falling star. Great gods above! Howell exclaimed. He started to laugh and bit his lip to stop himself. But, Michael, this isn't the spell I left you. Where did you find it? On the bench, in that heap of things Sophie piled round the skull, said Michael. It was the only new spell there, so I thought... How leapt up and sorted among the things on the bench. Sophie strikes again, he said. Things skidded right and left as he searched. I might have known. No, the proper spell's not here. He tapped the skull thoughtfully on its brown, shiny dome. You're doing, friend? I have a notion you come from there. I'm sure the guitar does. Uh, Sophie, dear. What? said Sophie. Busy old fool, unruly Sophie, said Howell. Am I right in thinking that you turned my doorknob black side down and stuck your long nose out through it? Just my finger, Sophie said with dignity. But you opened the door, said Howell, and the thing Michael thinks is a spell must have got through. Didn't it occur to either of you that it doesn't look like spells usually do? Spells often look peculiar, Michael said. What is it really? Howell gave a snort of laughter. Decide what this is about. Write a second verse. Oh, Lord, he said and ran for the stairs. I'll show you he called as his feet pounded at them. I think we wasted our time rushing around the marshes last night, Sophie said. Michael nodded gloomily. Sophie could see he was feeling a fool. It was my fault, she said. I opened the door. What was outside? Michael asked with great interest, but Hal came charging downstairs just then. I haven't got that book after all he said. He seemed upset now. Michael, did I hear you say you went out and tried to catch a shooting star? Yes, but it was scared stiff and fell in a pool and drowned, Michael said. Thank goodness for that, said Howell. It was very sad, Sophie said. Sad, was it? said Howell, more upset than ever. It was your idea, was it? It would be. I could just see you hopping about the marshes, encouraging him. Let me tell you, that was the most stupid thing he's ever done in his life. He'd have been more than sad if he'd chanced to catch the thing. And you... Calcifer flickered sleepily up the chimney. What's all this fuss about? he demanded. You caught one yourself, didn't you? Yes, and I... Howell began, turning his glass marble glare on Calcifer, but he pulled himself together and turned to Michael instead. Michael... Promise me you'll never try to catch one again. I promise, Michael said willingly. What is that writing, if it's not a spell? Howell looked at the grey paper in his hand. It's called Song, and that's what it is, I suppose. But it's not all here, and I can't remember the rest of it. He stood and thought, as if a new idea had struck him, one which obviously worried him. I think the next verse was important, he said. I'd better take it back and see. He went to the door and turned the knob black down.
Then he paused. He looked round at Michael and Sophie, who were naturally enough both staring at the knob. All right, he said. I know Sophie will squirm through somehow if I leave her behind, and that's not fair to Michael. Come along, both of you, so I've got you where I can keep my eye on you. He opened the door on the nothingness and walked into it. Michael fell off the stool in his rush to follow. Sophie shed parcels right and left into the hearth as she sprung up too. Don't let any sparks get on those, she said hurriedly to Carcifer. If you promise to tell me what's out there, Carcifer said, you had your hint, by the way. Did I? said Sophie. She was in too much of a hurry to attend. Chapter 11 In which Howl goes to a strange country in search of a spell. The nothingness was only inch thick after all. Beyond it, in a grey drizzling evening, was a cement path down to a garden gate. Howl and Michael were waiting at the gate. Beyond that was a flat, hard-looking road lined with houses on both sides. Sophie looked back at where she'd come from, shivering rather in the drizzle, and found the castle had become a house of yellow brick with large windows. Like all the other houses, it was square and new, with a front door of wobbly glass. Nobody seemed to be about among the houses. That may have been due to the drizzle, but Sophie had a feeling that it was really because, in spite of there being so many houses, this was somewhere at the edge of a town. When you've quite finished nosing, Hal called. His grey and scarlet finery was all misted with drizzle. He was dangling a bunch of strange keys, most of which were flat and yellow and seemed to match the houses. When Sophie came down the path, he said, We need to be dressed in keeping with this place. His finery blurred as if the drizzle around him had suddenly become a fog. When it came into focus again, it was still scarlet and grey, but quite a different shape. The dangling sleeves had gone, and the whole outfit was baggier. It looked worn and shabby. Michael's jacket had become a waist-length padded thing. He lifted his foot with a canvas shoe on it and stared at the tight blue things encasing his legs. I can hardly bend my knee, he said. You'll get used to it, said Hal. Come on, Sophie. To Sophie's surprise, Hal led the way back up the garden path toward the yellow house. The back of his baggy jacket, she saw, had mysterious words on it. Welsh rugby. Michael followed Hal, walking in a kind of tight strut because of the things on his legs. Sophie looked down at herself and saw twice as much skinny legs showing above her knobby shoes. Otherwise, not much about her had changed. Howell unlocked the wavy glass door with one of his keys. It had a wooden notice hanging beside it on chains. Rivendell, Sophie read, as Howell pushed her into a neat, shiny hall space. There seemed to be people in the house. Loud voices were coming from behind the nearest door. When Howl opened that door, Sophie realised that the voices were coming from magic-coloured pictures moving on the front of a big square box. Howl! exclaimed a woman who was sitting there knitting. She put down her knitting, looking a little annoyed, but before she could get up, a small girl who had been watching the magic picture very seriously with her chin in her hands leapt up and flung herself at Howl. Uncle Howl! she screamed, and jumped halfway up Howl with her legs wrapped round him. Mary, Howl bawled in reply. How are you, Cariad? Been a good girl, then? He and the little girl broke into a foreign language, then fast and loud. Sophie could see they were very special to one another. She wondered about the language. It sounded the same as Calcifer's silly saucepan song, but it was hard to be sure. In between bursts of foreign chatter, Howell managed to say, as if he were a ventriloquist, This is my niece Mary and my sister Megan Parry. Megan, this is Michael Fisher and Sophia... Hatter, said Sophie. Megan shook hands with both of them in a restrained, disapproving way.
She was older than Hal, but quite like him, with the same long, angular face, but her eyes were blue and full of anxieties, and her hair was darkish. Quiet now, Mary, she said in a voice that cut through the foreign chatter. Howell, are you staying long? Just dropped in for a moment, Hal said, luring Mary to the floor. Gareth isn't in yet, Megan said in a meaning sort of way. What a pity. We can't stay, Hal said, smiling a warm, false smile. I just thought I'd introduce you to my friends here, and I want to ask you something that may sound silly. Has Neil by any chance lost a piece of English homework lately? Funny you should say that, Megan exclaimed. Looking everywhere for it he was last Thursday. He's got this new English teacher, see, and she's very strict. Doesn't just worry about spelling either. Puts the fear of God into them about getting work in on time. Doesn't do Neil any harm, lazy little devil. So here he is on Thursday, hunting high and low, and all he can find is a funny old piece of writing. Ah, said Hal. What did he do with that writing? I told him to hand it in to this Miss Angorian of his, Megan said. Made sure he tried for once. And did he? Hal asked. I don't know. Better ask Neil. He's up in the front bedroom with that machine of his, said Megan. But you won't get a word of sense out of him. Come on, Hal said to Michael and Sophie, who were both staring round the shiny brown and orange room. He took Mary's hand and led them all out of the room and up the stairs. Even those had a carpet, a pink and green one. So the procession led by Hal made hardly any noise as it went along the pink and green passage upstairs and into a room with a blue and yellow carpet. But Sophie was not sure the two boys crouched over the various magic boxes on a big table by the window would have looked up even for an army with a brass band. The main magic box had a glass front like the one downstairs, but it seemed to be showing writing and diagrams more than pictures. All the boxes grew on long floppy white stalks that appeared to be rooted in the wall at one side of the room. Neil, said Howell. Don't interrupt, one of the boys said. He'll lose his life. Seeing it was a matter of life and death, Sophie and Michael backed toward the door, but Howell, quite unperturbed at killing his nephew, strode over to the wall and pulled the boxes up by the roots. The picture on the box vanished. Both boys said words which Sophie did not think even Martha knew. The second boy spun round, shouting, Mary, I'll get you for that. Wasn't me this time, so? Mary shouted back. Neil whirled further round and stared accusingly at Howl. How do, Neil? Howl said pleasantly. Who is he? the other boy asked. My no-good uncle, Neil said. He glowered at Howl. He was dark, with thick eyebrows, and his glower was impressive. What do you want? Put that plug back in. There's a welcome in the valleys, said Howl. I'll put it back when I've asked you something and you've answered. Neil sighed. Uncle Howell, I'm in the middle of a computer game. A new one? asked Howell. Both the boys looked discontented. No, it's one I had for Christmas, Neil said. You ought to know the way they go on about wasting time and money on useless things. They won't give me another till my birthday. Then that's easy, said Hal. You won't mind stopping if you've done it before, and I'll bribe you with a new one. Really? Both boys said eagerly, and Neil added, Can you make it another of those that nobody else has got? Yes. But just take a look at this first and tell me what it is, Hal said and he held the shiny grey paper out in front of Neil. Both boys looked at it. Neil said, It's a poem, in the way most people would say, It's a dead rat.